So Rahul, welcome to the Feel Better Live More podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. So I thought, you know, your, your new book is, is full of practical tips and tools, as well as some great stories and anecdotes from your career as a neurosurgeon. But I thought a really nice place to start would be, you know, you're here in London, you're doing promotion for your book. How's the jet lag doing? <laughs> jet lag is terrible because I haven't uh, done all the tips people might, you know, think that are valuable to break jet lag, drink a lot of water, don't have a glass of wine, try to get sleep. My son and I are here. We're going hard in London. We are, we've been to Stonehenge. We've taken a bike tour. We went to Tate, Britain, saw Van Gogh. So we're, we're just uh, enjoying it all. And I think it's liberating to be able to see London both as a tourist and to get into these corners such as meeting you and being in this space. So I'm having a, a great time and thank you again for including me. Hey Rahul, it's so, it's so refreshing to hear that, that you've actually come to do your promo tour with your son. How old is your son? He's 14. I have three, 13, 14, and 17. I take them, I take them all over the corners of the world and it's never for business. It's always for pleasure. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And we're, we're definitely going to explore children's health and, and brain health a little bit later. Um, you said you're not doing the things that you should be doing for jet lag. And I'm really interested. We're currently speaking. It's about 11 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, where do you live in America? I live in Los Angeles. Okay, so eight hours behind. So your body clock is potentially thinking it's three in the morning. Yeah. So we know that sleep is critical for mm -hmm. brain health. So what's going on in your brain at the moment, given that you are trying to be alert, trying to have a conversation with me about brain health, when your body thinks it's 3 a.m. Yeah, sleep deprivation is unhealthy. On occasion, it's okay, but prolonged sleep deprivation is not good for you. It gives you diseases. For a short trip like this, I'm familiar with sleep deprivation. I did surgical training in, in the States <laughs> before, they, before they limited the hours to 88, and I mean, we were doing 40-hour shifts. Uh, for me, when I'm sleep deprived, uh, I become disinhibited, more candid, uh, a bit more jovial. I think that works for me during this trip. So I'm, uh, I'm okay with it. But for most people, they should understand that we, as well as plants, grew on a planet th that has a revolution. And so it's a diurnal basis of not just our sleep patterns, but the DNA and our tissue changes at night and during day. We're meant to cycle that way. And it's not from the pineal gland and melatonin that regulates it. It's actually from a suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's a fancy term for a structure hanging down beneath your brain that you can access through your nose. And it is based on a 24-hour clock. And a recent Nobel Prize was given to it. So the getting into a rhythm of day and night is extremely important for your health. It is designed not in your, not just in your brain, but in the DNA readouts in your liver and your muscle and your intestines. So it's mind-body regulation that the sun and the setting sun and the rising sun does. Sure. And then as in the Western world, but actually all over the world now, yeah. as um, we move to 24-hour societies and shift work is common, we know that that has a detrimental impact on our health. But for you as a neurosurgeon, you, you were talking about your early days as mm. a trainee. So you are there, you're cutting open someone's skull. What are the effects of you doing that when you're sleep deprived? Because if you're working 88 hours plus yep. a week, you must have operated at some point when sleep deprived. Yeah, I have operated uh, sleep deprived for maybe a decade when I was in training. Back then, it was the way to staff hospitals. You couldn't hire five trainees to work 30, 40 hours each. Some people felt like that's the only way to uh, get the necessary experience. And when they limited it, what we found in the States was when they limited the work hours, the complications and the errors didn't go down because that increase in handoffs also raised the risk yeah. for the patient. So it didn't solve all the problems, but it was a major problem. What is it like to feel? What is it like operating when you're sleep deprived? I think we select for ourselves in medical school. I think there are. Uh, certain personality traits and driven personalities that go into brain surgery or maybe cardiac surgery. And on occasion, we end up working in areas where you can't call another doctor the next day. In many of the smaller towns in the States, yeah. if you do a brain surgery and the next day you need to tinker with that patient's skull again, as you said, you can't call somebody else. So if you didn't sleep that night, you still have to perform. I think general limiting of work hours is great. Me, when I was sleep deprived as, training, uh, as a trainee, there was usually another professor alongside with you, so you were a team. But is performance affected by sleep deprivation? 
Absolutely. Can you still perform a task in a capable manner? I like to think I did so. But truck drivers to cops to surgeons and definitely pilots, sleep deprivation is not only bad for your health, it's, uh, it's the best way to not perform well, if that's your goal. Yeah, and it's interesting that those professions now have limits, yep. don't they? Drivers have All limits, pilots have limits. Yeah. I guess we as doctors in our profession, yeah. we, we've been pretty late to the game yeah. in terms of recognizing our fallibility and yeah. that's actually being sleep deprived. I mean, I, yeah. I can, like, I started off um, as a physician doing nephrology. That mm. was the, the specialty I had chosen to go for and, and was doing before I switched. And I can remember so clearly, um, I was a junior, or what you guys call an intern, I'm guessing. I was probably mm-hmm. what we call a second year SHO here, senior house officer. And we were still doing the old-fashioned on-call shifts. So yep. I got to work at 8 a.m., worked all day, and then I was on call that night. And, you know, I was working through to the following day, to the yep. evening. And I remember getting there. And, you know, it relied on the fact that you would usually grab a couple of hours or something at night. You would normally quieten down so you could actually maybe put your head down for an hour or two, and that would get you through. But we just had a busy night. Lots of yeah. acutes came in. I remember I didn't get to the mess. Yeah. I didn't get to my room. And I was thinking as, as a junior doctor at the time, I thought, hey, I'm sure when my senior gets in, they'll probably let me home early today. Yeah. And it didn't happen. Yeah. And, I did, and, and then we said, oh, are you prep for the afternoon ward round? I was like, in my head, I'm thinking, I'm exhausted. Yeah. Anyway, when I did finish at about 4 or 5 p.m., yeah. so I'd been working for, and I know you've done this many, many times, but just my own experience of that was, well, that was a good, what, 24 hours, then another 10, at least 34, 35 hours yeah. of work. Yeah. I remember I was in the car on the way home on the ring road from Manchester, and the traffic had stopped because it was busy, you know? And the next thing I know... There's horns going on around me. Because you're shut down. I've, I've fallen asleep in the middle mm. lane. That's scary. So, so all the other cars around me have gone, and everyone behind me is beeping me. And that scared the life out mm. of me. Suddenly, that wakes you up. I mean, that got me home, no problem. But but that is that is really scary and dangerous. Mm. So I guess the, the question is, you know, we talk, and we're going to go into what sort of proactive things we can do for our brain health. But mm. given that we're living in a sleep-deprived society is arguably the most dangerous place to be in a motor vehicle because how many people around you are actually sleep deprived and are are operating a a car, you know, without the ability to do so optimally? I like that question. I mean, I think the semi-autonomous features in cars now that the steering wheels vibrate if you go out of your lane, those things will help. But we are... We are in an extremely distracted society. So let me backtrack to the story you were telling just now about, you know... uh, Acutes came in. That must mean a lot of admissions or a lot of things were happening in the middle of the night. I found, and the surgical residents I knew, if we were just given the opportunity for one, one and a half hours of sleep, it was actually better that we pulled an all-nighter. There was something weird about just shutting your brain down for just a touch. You hit the pillow, you pop back up in a 40-hour shift for, uh, for an hour and a half. It kind of threw off... Uh, threw off your energy and your focus even more than just enduring the night awake. So I used to, rather than get an hour of sleep, I'll just walk around the ICU talking to nurses and seeing what's going on. But that let, and that's a story I mentioned in the book, that led me to understand a little bit about the dangers of disrupted sleep. And what I talk to my kids about is, it's, you know, they say you want seven, eight, nine hours of sleep. I re- if you could get five hours of uninterrupted sleep, that might be better than eight hours where you got up once or twice to answer your phone or it pinged and the light went on. So disrupted sleep is now almost an epidemic because of all the devices and lights that are near us that are tripping up that circadian rhythm we talked about, the sunrise and sunset that we uh, that, that led to our evolution of how these uh, biological cycles work. I think the treatment for that is more sophisticated devices. The devices aren't going anywhere. I don't want them to go anywhere. I like having a superpower computer in my left pocket. The first thing I look at, and sometimes it's the last thing I look at. But if we could regulate the glow, the access, the frequency for our kids, that's what I do with my teenage sons is, let's just start turning it down around eight and just give me an hour without a phone in your face before you go to bed. I mean, they're teenagers, and that's a big ask. And they said, why? I said, well, it would be great to just have your brain entertain itself for one 
one damn hour rather than having a device pummeling content into you. I think the ability to drift into random thoughts is very important to the brain, especially the moments before you drift into sleep. Yeah. And so I have tried my best to, they all have phones, they do their thing. I don't really, I don't, I don't really, I talked about the f- digital diet. Just choose good content as well as all the indulgences on your phone. Mix it up and just get it out of your face the last hour before you go to bed. Fridays and Saturdays, my wife and I will binge on Netflix and fall asleep sometimes with a laptop in the bed. There's nothing wrong with that. But for kids in particular, the ability to be creative and daydreamers is fundamental. And I worry that these devices are tripping them up before they go to bed. Yeah, I think the the, the point about uh, downtime, yeah. I think it's really important. It's something I've written about in, in my last book, The Stress Solution, all about mm. stress and its impacts on our health. And one of the things I see happening in society is that downtime is slowly being eroded mm-hmm. from our lives. So yeah. the example I often give is, you know, you're here in London, right? If you were here 15 years ago in London, I'm going to guess that if you went into a local cafe to order a coffee... You would stand in line and you know what? You'd, you'd probably be daydreaming, people watching, looking around mm-hmm. you. You might be looking mm-hmm. at all the pastries mm-hmm. and trying to think, am mm-hmm. I going to have one? Am I not going to have one? You might interact with the barista. If you go into anyone now, as I'm sure you have done since you've got here, and again, I'm not criticized because I do the same thing mm-hmm. a lot of the time. We're all stuck in our phones, right? Yeah. We're trying to catch up on that email. Oh, I'll quickly check Instagram. Every little bit of downtime now I think it's been eroded mm-hmm. out, and I think that's having a consequence. So my question really is, what is that doing to your brain when we're constantly distracted, when we're not allowing ourselves to just be and allow our minds to wander? Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. And the reason is we don't have enough data for that. So the question is also asked about the devices maybe being beneficial for grandparents because they can have access to children's uh, videos and posts. So the effect of social media and constantly being on your phone, because my children, when they're looking at their phone, they're, they're swiping Instagram. Yeah, I'm checking emails and swiping Instagram. They're just swiping Instagram. And the visual content, and they look up, they seem to function well. I mean, they're multitasking well, but you're right. There seems to be, there is no empty space in the day where again they're not being pummeled by some visual stimuli from their from their phone. We don't know the effects they're having um, because it's been 10, 15 years, and as you know, you, you need data over longer periods of time. Like when they figured out the mind diet, or it was over yeah. decades, cardiac issues over decades. So I don't have an answer for is it changing the structure or function of children's brains, but. Uh, in you know, undoubtedly it is. I'm just curious to see which doctors and scientists are going to be able to figure that out. Yeah, I'm not sure it's all for the worse. Hey, I- I'm sure it is not all for the worse. I think there are so many benefits to yeah. social media, but I'm sure there are some negatives as yeah. well. And I'm sure we're probably having a huge global experiment at the moment. Yep. And I don't think it's necessarily the technology; it's how we're using yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Same with booze, right? Yeah. Same with anything, yeah. right? If, if you're drinking yeah. a bottle of wine, if yeah. a bottle of wine every day. That's going to have a certain impact on you. Yep. Whereas if you're having a glass of wine every now and again with your friends as part of a, a lovely meal, that's going to have an, a different yeah. impact. Alcohol is the same drug, but it's having a different impact, right? Yeah. The, the phone thing is a very interesting conundrum. It is the way in which they engage the world, but it's also the way, in the, the, way the world can actually lead them to the wrong path. I mean, not just the phone. 13 Reasons Why it came out, there's a little bit of a spike in suicides. I don't know what to make of that. You know, I want them to know about it, but I didn't know what to make of that. We know what Facebook and politics that those rules weren't set right. So I love what you're saying about, the, listen, these devices aren't going anywhere. The television's not going anywhere. Rock and roll's not going anywhere. Drugs aren't going anywhere. But how do we structure some boundaries and constraints within those devices so people who uh, use them in a destructive manner uh, have some triggers? For example, gamblers, they don't ingest a drug, yet they do all kinds of, they can have an addiction that's equal to, equally yeah, yeah. addictive and destructive as cocaine, and they never put a chemical inside their body. So casinos have certain things with gamblers and rules. There's gambling hotlines. You start to put things in. I think for some of the kids that cannot manage and, and choose a healthy digital diet, or actually even a food diet, there should be some boundaries. Maybe, maybe the... 
maybe what we did with supersize at McDonald's also needs to apply within Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, YouTube is now making a kids channel because maybe it's not good to have kids channels and porn on the same thing. Yeah. So those constraints without being too stifling, because I, I tell my kids, I want to be allowed to make bad decisions. I don't want too many constraints. I just want to know the truth about them. And I think you've hit it perfectly. What's the way to let them have it, but set some boundaries up so they know when they're getting into dangerous terrain? I mean, you say you've hit it perfectly. I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> not convinced with my own children. I <laughs> am hitting it perfectly. I think, you know, I'm sure you're the same. You, you, you know, we're trying to figure it out, right? Yeah. We're trying to learn the science. We're trying to learn from our own intuition and we're trying to do the best that we can. And How old are your kids? My kids, my son has just turned nine, my daughter's six. Okay. So they currently. So you're right do, into it. Not quite yet, but almost with my son. No phone at nine? Not at the moment, no. Yeah. So I don't know if culturally it's different here from the US or where I live. I have no idea. But at the moment, it's not become an issue yet. But I'm expecting it to um, within weeks to months. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I'm sort of, it's interesting to hear how other parents do it, right? 11 or 12 is when we are three teenagers. Back then, there was that was the average age when somebody got a phone. And um, uh, the parental blocks are, are, are key. Yeah. And just the uh, heads up about those parental blocks, they're good at removing. So you sometimes have to supplement with another app or feature to make those... Uh, Even harder. Yeah. Because the, the reality yeah. is our kids are probably going to be more tech savvy than us. Yeah. And therefore, yeah. they're going to know how to get around these things. Yeah. Rahul, you mentioned um, rock and roll just now. And that yeah. got my attention. Uh, as, a, as a music fan my entire life, someone who spent a lot of his teenage years and 20s <laughs> And still now going to rock and roll concerts. Good for you. Um, That's great. That sort of piqued my interest. So rock and roll, or let's expand out music. music. What impact does music have on our brains? That we know. And there's actually uh, somebody in San Francisco or somewhere else. He's putting musicians in fMRI scanners. And those scanners don't tell the whole story, but they do tell something new compared to just putting electrodes on somebody's head. And so these different technologies that... You know, we're an electric, our, our brain f uh, flesh is electric. It's, I think of it as a jellyfish. It's, the tentacles are spraying chemicals and electricity. We can detect it from the surface of the brain, and we can actually put people in machines and look at blood flow. And when you do that for musicians, it's really interesting. Because it's a physical performance, if you're learning to play music, I think I want to pivot from listening to music, music to learning to play to mu learning to play music. That seems to be the thing that leads to the most left, right, right, left uh, connections and electrical currents passing through the corpus callosum. Your brain's like a walnut. There's a bridge in the middle, and music, hearing it, playing it, thinking about it, using your fingers to control it seems to pull from the most corners of our mind. And I can't imagine that not being good for you because as you know with the brain, if you don't use it, you lose it. It will downregulate. It will let w wither certain corners of the brain if they're not actively engaged. So I think music, especially when you're a kid, learning to play music has to be good for the brain. Do we have data on that? No. But do we have instinctual uh, feelings about it being beneficial? Yes. Yeah, and I think... Um as you say, instinctively, we think that, you know, a kid's learning a new skill, whether it's a sport yep. or a musical instrument, is likely to yield benefits. Um, I think one of, the, one of the reasons for me that might apply is because it often puts you into flow states. Very good. Um, you know, and I think for adults as well, you know, when, when, it, when something's that... You know, it's not too difficult that it's unachievable. But it's a little, bit, a little bit harder that we have to concentrate. You have to... You, you access that flow state. I find... Those people who get into the flow state, and I think some people have, uh, you know, may not know what that means, and they may think that's kind of fluffy, but there is a measurement for that. So, uh, when you're awake, the and resting and focused, those are alpha waves. If you look at, for example, sharpshooters, just the moment before they hit a target, likely athletes, a footballer scoring something, NFL quarterback, ballerina, the uh, the release from the constraints of thought that come from your frontal lobe and letting a well-trained behavior uh, exert itself, the brain is actually less active. It lights up less brightly. It's more efficient in its pathways. And that flow state is an alpha wave that's detectable. Similarly with Buddhist monks, likely with deep divers before they do their dive. It's a state of being focused, awake, 
and calm. And I think our phones and the technology and everything we're doing is pushing us away from that. So if we can find skills and habits that let us harness that, channel it, know how to get into it, that would be great. And I think learning music, and like they say with, uh, with music, learn it and then let it go, that's that alpha wave flow state that I think could be very beneficial for anybody to learn music. I guess what you're saying is essentially this whole idea that, you know, let's say a golfer, for example, mm -hmm. who who freezes and, and crumbles in the final back nine at a major tournament. And I'm, I'm super fascinated with this. This whole idea that when we learn a new skill, we are, you know, rashly, we're thinking mm -hmm. about it, we're trying to learn all those movements that we need. But then when we need to perform, mm -hmm. you know, we just want to have absorbed that, forget about, you know, rashly thinking about everything and just let it go. What I think is happening with a lot of those golfers and in any sport when you freeze is that you're starting to overthink again. Instead of just letting your innate ability that you've trained just come out, you're then starting to think, oh, yeah, okay, make mm -hmm. sure you get to this point in the backswing. Make sure you've stopped. I think it's what you said about letting go, right? Mm -hmm. Is Is that the key to allowing our brain to function at its peak, it's you learn and you then develop mastery and then you let it go. So you just allow it to perform. Yeah. And I think let's, let's dig into that a little bit deeper. Uh, I don't think when a surgeon is, is moving swiftly and with minimal trauma to tissue or a footballer is making their moves and you're thinking, well, this seems effortless. They look relaxed. They're moving in a way that, is, is efficient, it's not, it's not strained, you can see it in their face, they're not trying and thinking. That's not a reflex. Reflex is, you, I don't want people to think it's a, you've trained 10,000 hours an hour, you know, I don't, I don't believe in the 10,000 hours. Thing. Yeah. I like to have conversations with teenage kids and I go to dive bars in Los Angeles when I'm off duty and my friends are just a bunch of normal fellas. I just tell them, well, we know surgeons that have done 10,000 operations and they're still no good. So how can, how can it be 10,000, right? So the 10,000 thing, and that, I, that, that limits the inclusion of talent into the equation. And when people say flow, uh, uh, the, saying it's a reflex, you do it so much, it's reflexive, it's actually a, a misconception. Reflexes, I, as you know, the, you tap on my knee and I reflexively will kick it. It doesn't even go to my brain. Yeah. It just goes to my lower back and comes back and makes my leg move. That's a reflex. Um, thought and anxiety and controlling your uh, your movements, we know what that is. That's frontal lobe. That's too much CEO involved in the game. Uh, what is that flow state? What is somebody performing at a high level is one, somebody who's mastered something. Uh, just like a creative thought has to come on top of lots of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, a flow state has to come on top of lots of practice. And then uh, it's about harnessing the subcortical structures in my, it, this is the way I understand it. So the brain's like a canopy, the CEO's on top and you know, the cortical canopy is doing the thinking. But below that, on the way down uh, to our spinal cords, there are these subcortical structures that fine tune the movements. They're the structures where you see a snake and you jump, but then you realize it's plastic and the next time you don't fall for it. So there's all this subtle intuitive movement and instinctive responses going on. And the challenge of a flow state is once you've mastered it and you're golfing, you're in that back nine, like you said, the anxiety is making those subcortical structures say, freak out, freak right. out, uh, ask the CEO for help, and, and it's going to start interfering with it. And the mastery underneath is saying, just let it go. Most people will have a flow state when they're not under pressure and the lights aren't on. The challenging thing for athletes is how to deliver that under the stress of a game winning situation and and clutch performance to me that flow state is not performing better than what you would do in practice but just doing what you would normally do under these extremely anxiety provoking stressful conditions so, so for people listening to this who are not high performing athletes i think there's a lot of take home there for them so i submit that we all want peak performance in our lives whatever sure. whatever our life entails whatever we need to do whether it's be a father whether mm -hmm. it's to be a good office worker what be a, a neurosurgeon whatever it is we are all i think on some level wanting to perform at our peak so what can somebody listening to this or watching this on the video learn from what you've just said that athletes can do how can they yeah. use that to help them in their daily lives yeah thank you for that transition because uh the lessons we learn from athletes and ballerinas and other people apply to everybody. And so when we speak about 
what people can do uh, when they're stressed out on an LA freeway, um, when they're about to go into a meeting with a boss and you're anticipating something not going well, when you're coming home and your relationship hasn't been good, the time-tested method and the one that we now know, see, I don't want to just tell you things without telling you how I know and why I have the privilege to be even asked that question. To me, it's meditative breathing. It's a very powerful way to quell that anxiety storm that those instinctive structures have done. I'm going to see my boss and those subcortical structures are firing and they're unhappy, much like you'd see a snake where you're at the edge of a cliff. There's certain things that should be released in your body, but those have been uh, repurposed in a negative, destructive way where we feel that at work, we feel that at home, we feel that when we look at certain social media. How do we tamp that down? Just like we would slowly walk away from a fear of heights, how do we walk away from just the general anxiety that's filled our life during the day? And I deeply uh, believe, and particularly now because there's hardcore data, and I'll go into this a little bit, is meditative breathing. I don't know what mindfulness is. I don't know what your mind is thinking or my mind is thinking or your mind is thinking. But I know that that the brain is connected to the lungs and the heart through this thing called a wandering nerve. It comes down. And that that the brain can send signals down to your heart and Buddhist monks can slow down their heartbeat. I know when I put a little coil on there for people with epilepsy, kids with epilepsy, a vagal nerve stimulator, and we send electricity, the electricity can actually go upward into your brain wow. and quell epilepsy. Epilepsy seizures are an aberrant uh, electrical activity of your brain. Think of it as an arrhythmia of your heart is epilepsy of the brain. It's called a vagal nerve stimulator. It's been around for a while. This is something you can look up right now. We put electrical coil on this nerve, and it calms electricity. It's not even in the brain. But meditative breathing, deep breathing, an in, in a count of four to go in, a count of three, two, one to hold, and a slow release. If you do that just a little bit before you engage in that next stress-provoking task, it too works, like a vagal nerve stimulator without us having to do a little surgery, to calm the electricity in your brain. And you're saying, well, okay, that sounds, where did you get that? Well, we well, you know, you know meditation has been going on for a long time. We've seen Buddhist monks do certain things and others, deep divers are a great example of that. But we, we know this now because a study came out last year and children and young adults, and actually all people, if they have epilepsy, aberrant electrical activity of the brain, arrhythmia of the brain, if usually it treats with medicine, sometimes they find a little nodule we cut out. It's usually not cancerous. But sometimes we don't know where it begins. And it's hard to know what to do without understanding the origin of it. So they come in and they, ha they have brain surgery. We make a big incision. We remove the skull and we put a grid on the surface of the brain. It's not deep brain surgery. It's surface brain surgery. There is yeah. a difference. And then the wires come out of their head and they have to stay in the hospital for a week. And that's recording them 24-7 waiting to catch that, that, that firefly, that this origin of the seizure. Where is it? Because then with radiation, you can zap it and you can cure them of it, okay? Wow. So it's meant to be therapeutic. But what are they doing for that week when they're just kicking back, getting bored? So in come all the neuroscientists from San Diego, the highest per capita is at that, you know, the ocean clips <laughs> of San Diego. They come in and say, hey, can we hang out with you? And the recording's going on. Wow. And they actually asked them, let's do certain tasks, and then they went through like meditative breathing with these patients and these kids and these young people, and they're watching the electricity change and get closer to that alpha wave, get closer to the calmer electrical signals in their brain after just deep, slow, deliberate breathing. And that's accessible to us all without having to pay for it. So yeah. that's that a great would, thing. It's free, right? Oh, yeah. I'm, the book is not, is, is meant to be all the magical things that are right there. I mean, you could, when you pull into work before a big operation... I'll take a few minutes and just and just slowly breathe. Yeah. Medi and you can find an app, and it's a count of four in, hold for a couple, and count of four out. And then what happens is you don't have to count as much. Um, it, it becomes a habit. It becomes a part of your routine. It's free. You don't have to do it for 30 minutes. You're not going to be walking on coals and all the exaggerated, people, uh, exaggerated things uh, people think about. It is a resource available to you that has been harnessed for, for millennia, and that now you have crazy brain surgeons yeah. providing you the electrical proof if you're a skeptical kind of person. To me, that's magic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, it, it brings a lot of weight to this to this term, just breathe. I mean, it's, it's mm. deceptively simple, 
but it really works. And I know this year I'll be giving a lot of um, talks to companies about wellness and how they can improve productivity. And what's really interesting is that a breath that I sort of use with my patients, something I've written about a lot, is the three, four, five breath. When you breathe in for three, mm-hmm. you hold for four, mm-hmm. and you breathe out for five. Yep. And when I'm Perfect. talking to people, a group, I'll, I'll, I'll often, we'll collectively do just one of those breaths together, mm-hmm. which takes about 10 or 12 seconds. Yeah. And I ask people straight away, how do you feel? Uh, how, can you feel a difference mm-hmm. just on one breath? And about 80% of people put their hand up. And that's just one breath. You do that mm-hmm. a few times. Mm-hmm. As I say to them, five of those three, four, five breaths takes one minute. You will put your body in a different state because breathing is like information for your body and it's responding. So yeah. it's interesting that, you know, you as a neurosurgeon before a big operation will use breathing. Yeah. Thank you for that. And thank you for um, allowing people to find things about themselves uh, that can help themselves. You know, because that in itself is power, also. And you know, I, I'm from the states, and I'm from Los Angeles, and it has become a bit commercialized that people think medit. It's actually breathing. I, the meditative component is, I like to call it meditative breathing because it lets people know it's going to help them meditate whereas a lot of people say i don't know how to meditate what do you mean just think about mount everest or do i have to buy yoga pants and be in malibu and and drink green juice it just becomes so uh so distracted from the ascent the essence of it which is deliberate breathing just breathing and what happens is if for people who are thinking my gosh that can't work is well you got nothing to lose (laughs) you're you're equipped with it and i think many people i'm not saying 100 percent, they'll find that that's a wonderful habit to add to their life, to turn down the anxiety. Even if it just creates a pause before you go into an anxiety-provoking situation and lets you get your thoughts in order as well as uh, get your instincts under control so you don't go in there and say something outlandish or over the top, it's a great break in the day. It's a few minutes, and I like to do it uh, before I go to bed. I like to do it before a big case. I like to definitely do it before a meeting or a conversation. And sometimes, like before, when I came here, I didn't want to do it. I'm, you know, I, I don't want people to think I'm some yogi master with all that. I don't have any of it. I am breaking the rules and going hard in London. I am not doing meditative breathing before this because I want to just be loose and I want to be disinhibited. But if I were anxious, and this doesn't provoke anxiety. And, and I hope I'm not stress and, inducing and no, you like, being on this show. I love it. I mean, I, this is. You know, you're uh, you're offering me a creative avenue. That's that's the bucket in my mind that this interaction right now between yeah. you and me is. But for those people on the freeways or on the tube, stressed out, there's a resource available to you. And if you're listening to your earbuds with your phone, there's so many free apps that'll help you set the cadence. It's yeah. such an easy way and a smart way to get close to the flow state, turn down the anxiety. And I'll give you one last example. You're saying, okay, I, I believe him. I don't believe him. I, you know, I, yeah, okay, take you to a gnarly story again. There's this rare, uh, you know, f- the perturbation of the system is what sometimes reveals the, the mechanics, you know. So there's a disease called Moya Moya. The Japanese uh, people get it more than the rest of the world. Nobody knows why. I had a patient, a kid, and basically you have these four arteries popping off your heart going into your brain. And sometimes right when they pop through the skull, rather than breaking into this beautiful tree of small blood vessels, they get, uh, they get clogged at a young age. And these kids um, develop this fine blood vessels, this vasculature that's very sensitive uh, to breathing. And when we, when we have surgery that needs to be done on those patients, we have to tell the anesthesiologist at the end, don't let this kid cry. Because if they cry and hyperventilate and breathe too fast, the signals will be sent to the fine blood vessels to shrink. Hyperventilation, skittish breathing, is a squeezer of blood vessels that can clot off the work of our surgery and kids. This is a proof. I, I, this has been 20 years. Don't let kids cry after Moya Moya repair at a children's hospital. All the neurosurgeons can talk about it. So there's biology to slow breathing working through the vagus nerve. Yeah. And then there's also biology to, to rapid breathing and hyperventilating being uh, not good for the brain in certain conditions. So there is basis to breath controlling mind. Yeah, incredible. Um, I'm going to move to practical tips for us, what we can do in our lives as adults to help improve our brain health. But before we go there, 
You, when kids are coming up a lot, yes, that that example you just gave. I've had the pleasure of meeting your fourteen year old son, who's Thank just you. he's he's lovely, really, you know, it's just incredible to say hi. And and for me, actually, it's really nice to see you traveling with him on a PR tour, and it makes me think it's something I've thought about for years. I'd love to take my kids with me, but often we think. As you know, it's better for me just to go and do my work and then come back. But but actually just seeing and hearing you say how rewarding that experience is for you and your son, it, it, it makes me think about um, reevaluating how thank I you. do these things. So thank you for that. But I want to go d- deep into kids here. Okay. So you, in the, at the start of your book, I think it was interesting to me how your knowledge as a neurosurgeon has in some ways shaped mm-hmm. what you do with your children. And it's really to do with that attitude to risk. Some mm. of the things that we might perceive as risky, you allow them to do. I think I think it was climbing in trees, for mm. example. But some of the other things that others might allow them to do, like crossing a road, mm-hmm. you're pretty strict on. I wonder if you could elaborate. Yeah, that, so first of all, my wife... Uh, uh, unexpectedly got pregnant. Now, I say unexpectedly because she was an OBGYN in training and I was a neurosurgeon in training and she's like, I'm pregnant. I said, well, that was 100% your jurisdiction. I thought you had that under control. So we had kids when we were in training back when those hours were 40-hour shifts. So it was nuts back then, right? Wow. I mean, she was... so we And my siblings and her siblings... We're not the oldest, but we had kids first, and there was like a generation gap where I hadn't I hadn't seen kids being raised for a while, and so she and I just kind of made up our own stuff, you know. She's uh, so we brought in a lot of uh, what I call diversity of interactions, partly by necessity, partly by choice. Uh, we put them in a lot of different schools. Uh, we put them in a lot of different faith. Base schools, secular schools, we took them to a lot of different places. They ate a lot of different food, a lot of different music, grandparents, nannies. We did all those things. And part of what motivated me is when I, my, I had my kids when I was also in the children's hospital. And I remember reading the study uh, and people were suggesting, and I think later on an orphanage in Belarus proved it. Uh, such a sad case, but an, an illustrative one. So I always like to tell you my story, yeah. and it can be sometimes too intense and maybe even a bit macabre, but that lets you know, like, why why, I mean, why would we ask this guy about kids? Well, first, I got three teenage kids. Uh, I, I do children's brain surgery around the world, uh, usually in East, Eastern Europe and Central, South America. Uh, but the kids in an orphanage that were left alone and not tended to, the the beautiful undulating pattern of that brain, which is like a... The reason it's like that is like imagine taking a giant pizza and squeezing it like an accordion to put it into a box. It gives you more canopy square footage or square yeah. kilometers, if you will. And what happened was they started losing the ridge because they wow. they needed less parts of their brain. The brain is an energy hog. If you don't use it, it's tw- it's three pounds and it uses twenty percent of the blood flow. Twenty percent goes to that thing in our skulls. So. It's not advantageous to feed parts of the brain that you're not actually using. It'll start to wither, and I, H- hence you'll use it or lose it. Yeah, but in a in a in a in a way that that's an active process at the structural physical level. Parenting in a in a way that would preserve the the flesh inside my children's skulls was important to me. And then at a microscopic level, I was getting my PhD then, and we were seeing this thing called synaptic pruning. So in some ways, uh, the biology of the brain is very landscape architecture. We use words like pruning and, dendr- yeah. and dendrites. And you are born with more brain cells, all of us, than you're intended to keep. Right. And the ones you keep as a toddler when you're young uh, are the ones that were tickled, that were engaged. And we know that again, because if somebody's born with an eye that doesn't work, that part of the brain starts with brain cells, but if it's not using it, it'll let those things wither. So my parental approach, and I don't need, I don't know if it's working or not. It's not even about the outcome. I did. I took the best approach I could. I, could. Yeah. I just took them to all different stretches of experiences. I had them doing, uh, you know, free running for one one summer. They, they dabble with some music. We've traveled all over the world for pleasure, languages, food, constant interaction. And, and, and for example, what better thing for my 14-year-old son to come here and find himself uh, having the confidence and yeah. the ability to navigate London coming from Los Angeles? That's my gift to him. 
uh, as as a father. I'll let school do the algebra and the geometry and the and the grammar. I actually don't do homework with them. It's kind of a weird thing. I rather just chat with them like we're talking. I'll take a pull an interesting article. And I'll be like, hey, let's talk about this. I just want to hear how you think. Yeah. Just keep up with me. Talk to me. Teach it, me. It's interesting. Loads of new ideas there. What about what about the, you know the orphanage you mentioned? What was uh, going on there? So why were their brains? you know, adapting in the way that they were. Yeah. Was it a lack of touch? Was yeah, it, you know... It. It's, it's funny, lack of touch. The 40 hours when I was doing those shifts, I, I missed my kids. It was for a few years. And they were telling us not to have the kids in their bed. And I'm not trying to come up with policy or give no, no, medical I get advice it. on the show. I just, my wife and I, two medics at that time, two surgeons in training, we put the kit between us because of touch. I wanted to have them near me. I wanted them to hear me breathe. I wanted those things. And the lack of touch will shut down certain parts of your brain. The lack of sight, visual stimulation will shut down parts of your brain. And here is the thing that just really broke my heart. The introduction of a stressful environment will change the brain forever, right? If you have to fend off assault, if you have to worry about getting home safely, that's too much to put on that brain because now what you're doing is you're messing with the emotional thermostat, that subcortical structure. And you're going to make it harder for that kid to find that flow state in their life as they mature because you've primed them to always be under threat. And that survival instinct that lets them survive also gets in the way, gets in the way of happiness and tranquility. And I think I'm not a policy person, but that's why you need to put a lot of resources into kids. Because yeah. if you don't set that thermostat right, they're not going to be healthy adults. And you're going to be paying on the back end for people who are thinking about it from a financial point of view. Yeah, and then that's super fascinating. And I think, you know, those early years are critically important. We know that um, as, a, as, a, as a hopefully as a note of optimism for people listening who, who might be thinking, as many parents do, you know, maybe the first few years were very stressful and there were certain situations out of their control. Often you can feel very bad as a parent. Responsible, you think, guilty. Oh, what can I do now? But but we're gonna we are gonna come to these tips and there's things that we can always yep. do to improve our brain function. Yeah. Um and I and I do want to make sure we cover those. You mentioned well, two things about your about your children, about your son in particular, really. Um first one is why were you so cautious? This is what I got from reading your book mm. about letting your children cross the yeah. roads, yet you're happy them jumping tree. off trees. Okay, first question. And the second question is, you said that your son here in London, what a, what a great gift that he can now start to navigate his way around London. And mm. I was thinking about navigation. I was thinking about GPS, mm -hmm. smartphones. Um, is there a an unexpected consequence to our brains by outsourcing its ability to think you know many of us we, we don't know where we're driving anymore our gps takes us and if the gps mm -hmm. breaks down we don't know where we are we don't know yep. how to get back so yep. quite a few questions there yeah, what yeah. if you could tease your way through them yep no it i worked at a children's hospital and i saw how kids die so i <laughs> apologies to the audience this is just who i am i always learn from things and i have intense experiences but we saw kids choked they fell out of second story windows, they were burned, and they got hit by cars, all these ridiculous SUVs, giant vehicles and fast roads. And so when they were younger, I wanted them to be safe because uh, pediatric mortality, frankly, is, you know, that's the first thing you want to avoid. So that's why I didn't do, I didn't mind if they fell out of a tree and they've, they've, taken, <laughs> they've taken some scrapes. The one that's here now has got a scar from his forehead. He drove into, you know, rode his bike into a garage because I, again, I saw from Children's Hospital, that's stuff they heal from. And so that's why I didn't, at that time, want them to be crossing the crossing streets and stuff like that in the neighborhood. People because you're looking at death. Yeah, not an injury. You're First, from. you got to get them to live. You got to feed them and get them to live, and then you can do all those things we talked about by diversifying. And what are we robbing our kids from by letting them push the navigation up? So that's interesting. It, it's okay, in my opinion. I don't want them to be memorizers. It's okay for them to have all the capitals of American states that, that we used to have to memorize in their pocket. I'm like, I don't care if you get a good grade on that. That's not really what I'm, I'm not trying to grow robots. So that kind of memory and loss of capacity, I'm kind of okay with. But there's another type of memory called working memory uh, where they can juggle a lot of things. I got to get to school. I got this text. Multitasking. That's really a skill. That's what... 
that's what we all want to do better in, in a calm fashion, right? Although some neuroscientists will say that you, it's impossible to multitask. I, I've read that from many neuroscientists. There's a book, I don't know if it's The Organized Mind, where it I've says seen it, that. but I, you know. And I just completely disagree. You know, the high, highly functional people I know, my kids, they can do a lot of different things. Not necessarily eight projects on the kitchen table at the same time, but I mean multitask eight different things that need to get done during the day without dropping the ball yeah. and connecting them in a seamless fashion. I think that's that's called working memory. I think that's important. The particular so thing- So we're talking about different things. Yeah, yeah. so exactly. So it, it, uh, just raw memorization of phone books, I don't mind if they leave that, lose that. Able to get through the day and not drop the ball and know what comes first, what comes second, priorities. As you know, when the acutes came in, you had to take care of the triaging is yeah. working memory. And then, but the navigation one I have, I'm particularly opinionated about. I don't like them to press the route app. And he said, well, where does that come from? Why, is he just, is he making that stuff up or where does he get that? The temporal lobe actually has uh, grid cells, G-R-I-D. Neuroscientists have found that there are cells and particular clusters of tissue in the temporal lobe that help you with spatial navigation. And so what I tell my kids is, come on, you got to be good at this, because this, stable, this spatial navigation is that cognitive reserve that you build now is what people lose in dementia when people have Alzheimer's, they can't find their way home. It's in that same space. So building up spatial navigation is good for you now, it's good for when you're older, it's good when you're a surgeon, it's good if you're driving. And those grid cells are important to cultivate. So what we do, uh, and many people will do it their own way, but for my sons, if we're going somewhere in Los Angeles, uh, or even around the world, let's just look at the map. You can press route if you want, but then you got to put it away. 101 South, 10 East, exit this, make a left. So I want them to think about the sequence of navigating uh, an environment. And if you think about it, it was probably useful thousands of years ago in the yeah. savannah, like which cave, which rock, that's a very important skill to have. And it's deeply rooted in neuroscience and biology in our yeah. brain. I love it. It reminds me a little bit. And, and I, I, I've got to be honest, my tendency is to go a bit extreme on things sometimes when I apply them to myself. I'm really kind and compassionate, I hope, to my patients and a lot more relaxed. With myself, I can be quite tough sometimes. And um, when I used to do a lot of uh, house visits or house calls, I think you guys call them, uh, from, from general practice, um, I remember... I, my car did not have a sat nav mm -hmm. at that time. It still doesn't, actually. And I was quite resistant to using them. So what I would do is when I knew I've got to go and visit these three patients, I'd write down their address. I'd look on Google Maps as to roughly where they were in relation to the surgery that, where I was mm -hmm. working. And I sort Let's of try would, to hold on to that. I'd lock it into my head. And then I'd go to my car and sort of try and pictureize mm -hmm. it and go, let me see if I can figure it out and get there. And I guess what I didn't realize I was doing uh, is that I was working out these grid cells, yeah. which yeah. I feel pretty good about myself now that I was doing it. But no, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? That All it, my suggestions, I want there to be a scientific basis. Yeah. Not that other suggestions aren't great. No. But I'm not here to give you suggestions that I can't back up with hardcore science or clinical stories. Yeah. And grid cells do exist. They're in hardcore neuroscience journals. Yeah. And it explains why preserving navigation and thinking about that. So people want to do puzzles. People want to, uh, should be thirsty for challenge. I think holding on as navigation in a three-dimensional environment is very important. Yeah. I want to move now to practical tips sure. because this podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. The reason it is, it's quite self-explanatory, but I believe that when we feel better in ourselves, when we're functioning better, we get more out of our lives. We've got more energy to do the things we want to do. We've got more cognitive capacity to do the things that we like to do in our spare time and even at work. Yeah. And there's plenty of tips in the book. I want to sort of, I wouldn't say quick fire, but just go through them systematically. I, I was really struck by a paragraph I read that um, I think it was in your book about how even at 60 or 70 years old, a few simple lifestyle changes with patients or, or with the public has been shown to increase their performance on cognitive tests. And I think that's really empowering for people okay. when they think, oh, well, I didn't do this. I've had a stressful life. Yeah. Wait a minute. There are still things you can it's do. It's not too late. So let's go through what are some of the things that people can do, whether it's their diet, whether it's, you know, Whatever, you, you, you go through some of the tips that you think are useful. And I thought about how to explain that so it's not too much of a listicle for people. And let's, let's do a 24-hour day about, um, I'm just 
I'm just thinking about this now. I'm just going to take you through things you can do um, you, if you have the luxury. So first of all, food. I mean, people are starving in this world and food scarcity and bad food. I, I'm respectful of that. That said, um, if you wake up, consider skipping breakfast a couple of times a week. In neuroscience journals, and from what we know about the biology of it, that intermittent fasting, going 16 hours a couple of times a week without eating glucose, will, your liver will run out of its glucose reserves. It will burn fat into these things called ketones. The brain is a hybrid vehicle. It's not all gas. It's not all electric. It likes both. And so if you have dinner at 8 and it's Monday evening, consider having uh, your next meal be midday the next day. That's an easy way to get to 16 hours. It doesn't mean you're fasting for days and days. There is neuroscientific literature that intermittent fasting is good for attention and focus. Okay, now it's lunchtime, and you're thinking about what to eat. Before that, I would consider taking five minutes um, to just breathe deeply like you're doing now. Just bake deep breaths a couple of times a day, three times a day for three minutes. Make it easy. See how that works for you. Just the pause might be helpful. Now it's time to eat. The food you choose is important. And I, there's delicious food to eat that's actually good for your brain. And how do I know that? Well, we don't have a pill for Alzheimer's, but we do have the MIND diet, which is essentially Mediterranean food um, that if you look at a group of thousands of people over a long period of time, they had less dementia. So now that you've figured out the cadence of eating, which is intermittent fasting, skipping breakfast a couple of uh, days a week, now that you've brought in uh, pre-lunch three minutes of just deep breathing, that's meditative breathing, choose plants, choose nuts, choose occasional fatty fish. The fatty fish has omega-3s, which is an essential component of your of of your brain. It's the wrapping around all those connections that keeps those electrical signals firing faster. And on that point, given the growing tendency to follow a vegan diet, mm -hmm. in your opinion, can that be problematic? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Because this is a good question. I was asked this at, uh, at Stella McCartney's yesterday, and there are good nutritional sources uh, for B vitamins as well as omega threes, I don't have the the names so of those you, jars. They, they but can supplement if they're yeah. choosing to go vegan. They yeah. you would they recommend can. they supplement with something containing B omega three. Vitamin. Well, and, and B. B vitamins. But if they supplement omega threes from fish oil, then they're not vegan anymore. But sure. there are other supplements. And what I also also say is the benefits of being vegan, if you can pull it off, are so great that a little bit less omega threes because you're not eating fish. I think. It far out, uh, you know, far, far uh, exceeds is that. that. Is that are you saying that relative to the standard? Uh, of course, you live in America, so the standard yeah. American or the standard Western diet. Yeah. Relative to that, are you suggesting an in increasing plant foods is generally a good thing? Absolutely. Not only is it it's a good for the animals that you're not killing, it's good for the planet, but it's actually what your body prefers. It's healthier for you, and if you want to eat meat, uh, consider the Mediterranean diet where it's fatty fish and, and poultry. Pass on the beef, pass on the fried food, pass on the um, processed food. Now, if you do have a burger, you're not going to undo what you did. Just make those things an indulgence rather than a habit. So now you're uh, at lunchtime, you've chosen the Mediterranean diet, more plants, less meat, the right kind of meat, and your day goes on. And then the question is, What's next to improve your health? A bit of exercise is great. The brain likes exercise because it is flesh. Don't don't clog the plumbing to your garden because swaths of your garden will wither. So people have strokes and injuries. It's because blood flow is not getting into their brain. That's the way to hurt the structure of your brain. So what's good for the heart is good for the brain. Then the other thing it does is it bathes itself in these uh, neurotrophic factors. That's what my science is on, BDNF, brain okay. drivers. And so that's what my grants are on. When the brain exercises, it showers itself. It's not like thigh muscles release uh, healthy brain chemicals that swim up there. It's got its own pharmacy. You give it the right behavior and interaction, it'll reward itself. So exercise keeps the plumbing open to the flesh of the brain, as well as releases molecules that serve as miracle, miracle growth for the brain. A couple of times a week is a good place to start. Do we know what specific exercise is good for the brain and good for BDNF levels, or, or is it 
a mix. We don't. Well, some people are starting to suggest uh, some strength training is an essential component. So sure. if you're just running a marathon, you might want to throw in some light weights. But more, a little bit more exercise than you're currently doing is, a good thing. is, is what the brain's going to say, hey, I like this direction. I'm going to shower myself with BDNF. Yeah, exactly. And I think we can... Look, strength training, I'm a huge fan of strength training. I do think we undervalue muscle mass in society and in health. But generally speaking, for most of us, if we just increase how much we move... Get uh, vertical even. Yeah. That's Get good. out of the chair. That, that's going to that's gonna help. Just the postural elements of standing yeah. is a first step. Next thing you know, you're walking. Next thing you know, you're taking the stairs. Uh, so these are simple things. These are free things. And... Um, so exercise, and then the day the day moves on, and you're getting to the evening. Uh, if you can, I like to read something completely unfamiliar. I've got a stack of old magazines, and I just flip through just just new new content for your mind. And I think it's since it's thinking flesh, and of course it likes blood, it likes to be irrigated. Of course, it likes a certain kind of diet because of the components it needs, but it also wants to think. If you ask Usain Bolt, I mean, how do you get your thigh muscles stronger to take some stairs. Well, how do you get your brain to be healthier? Think. And everybody's level, next level of thought and challenge is individual. We don't all have to do the same puzzles. We don't all have to have the same career, but get out of your comfort zone, if you will, just with the thoughts. So flip through something different on your phone, read something different on your phone, develop a new habit. I think that's important. And then for those of us who have... Um, creativity as an ambition and I have the luxury of having uh, creativity as an ambition because uh, cutting out a cancer from somebody's brain is a three-dimensional thing uh, understand trying to guess what mother nature is how mother nature is working in science is a creative thing we, we're, I'm not a technician uh, I'm not a I'm not an intellectual frankly in the end I, I'm an instinctive person who wants to harness his creativity so um, you know, people are microdosing, people are doing different things, but we're, you know, those, that requires pharmacological intervention. I don't support that. What I would say is we're all wildly creative in our dreams and people are finding that when you, uh, on the transition from awake to asleep and from sleep to uh, waking up, it's called hypnagogic and hypnopompic. There's actually those same alpha waves that we've been talking about just for 10, 20 minutes as you drift uh, into sleep and your tasks are done. And Salvador Dali mentioned that. And like he uses sleep as a psychedelic tool for creativity to solve problems. It's not going to happen every time, but I like to look at my riddles at the end of the night in my, in, and I have a notes app and I write a few things and I wake up and I write a few things. That transition is like sort of a strange portal to your subconscious. And again, based on science, if you put some electrodes on a brain at that time, you have those alpha waves that we talked about awake but focused and calm. And you also have these other waves, these delta waves, that waves that are um, light sleeping, early dreaming. It's the only time where you have both awake and asleep waves. And I've heard in one of your articles, sorry, I've read in one of your articles that you say, leave a pen next to your bed mm -hmm. so that you can actually take advantage when those creative thoughts come just before bed or just when you wake up, you, you can actually just jot them down. And yeah, and, uh, yeah that's that's incredible. You, you said learn new things. Yeah. Um, how important can learning a new language be? Oh, it's an essential thing. And whether you get it right is actually secondary. It's the, it's the process of trying to learn. So yeah. language, music, the act of learning makes your brain say, I got I to gotta pull from different pathways. I got to get to different corners of my mind. It's actually an energy consuming activity. And, and that's what engages the, the greatest corners and recesses of your mind is to learn new things, particularly music, particularly languages, social interactions. We know these things. And now I'm just trying to give you a biological basis yeah. that brain's efficient if it wants to fall into its rut. And breaking the rut in a constructive way is going to be good for your brain globally as your mind, thoughts and emotions, as well as the flesh. It, that's, that's one strong way to stave off dementia. Yeah, and that's very powerful, you know, keeping your brain active, trying new things. And I think what you said was super empowering. It's not about whether you can actually master that language. It's yeah. not about whether you master playing the piano. <laughs> Just the process of trying yeah. to, yeah. that's going to do all the groundwork and, and yeah. all the sort of heavy lifting in the brain, which is, which is super empowering. Doing things with your non-dominant hand. Hmm. I'm asking 
A, because I'm interested, but B, it's something that I often do with my son. Like, I, we've been playing uh, table tennis. Do you call it table tennis mm-hmm. in, in America? Or mm-hmm. ping pong? Um, Both. We, we've... You know, we've been playing that in the back garden, and um, sometimes we'll try and play with our left hands. We're mm-hmm. both right-handed, mm-hmm. and and Daddy says to him, "Hey, you know, this is really good for your brain. This, you know, try and do it with your left yeah. hands." What's going on there, and is it good for your brain? Yeah, it is. I'm a two-handed surgeon. Neurosurgery requires the use of left and right. So to facilitate that, I had a mentor when I was younger say, "You know, put your right arm in a sling for a little bit, just 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 to be crazy, just to be." just to see how that goes. And over a few weeks, it's awkward, but your left hand, if it's your non-dominant hand, it can catch up quite a bit. And that that effort to learn how to use parts of your body that that you weren't, you know, relying upon is what I learned about from my patients. You know, when they have injuries, when they come in with stroke or they've had a brain tumor moved, sometimes they have weakness in their arms and legs and their ability to speak. They have these... Um, central nervous system issues and and they have to rely on what's left um and that is a very powerful thing because when they come back to clinic three weeks later or you see them three months later they're quite facile and that is brain plasticity that is brain rehab relying on extremities relying on thought relying on communication that you wouldn't originally had so when i use my mouse with my left hand and force myself to do that or chopsticks and I encourage my kids to do that, what it's doing is the left hand, for me, that's non-dominant, is controlled by the right side of the brain. That part of the brain, if you don't engage it, will also start to wither a little bit. Yeah. And so before you get into those habits, and again, nobody's saying if you're going to throw the football for a championship game to use your non-dominant hand, but the recruitment of brain cells in your right hemisphere by using your left hand and your left arm to bring in habits, I think is a powerful and effective way. Not only does it bring those brain cells in, just think about at the musculoskeletal level, if using your phone your whole life with your right hand, you're going to stave off arthritis by bringing in the other hand as well. So it's good for your brain. It's good for your joints. It's a way to be a more balanced person physically. And music, again, it's a two-handed sport, yeah. uh, brings that in nicely. Yeah, incredible. Rahul, look... Just to finish this off then, I know we've gone through tips, but if I'm going to push you a little bit here. Sure. Um, I always like to lead the listener with some really actionable, practical tips that they can apply in their own lives immediately to improve the way that they feel or improve the way that their brain functions. So what are your top four tips sure. for people listening to this that they can think about applying into their own life? Um, one would be uh, get vertical. That's the most essential thing. When I see our patients who can come out of a bed and stand, they they grow. You can see a withering flower come back to life if they can get vertical. Being standing and moving is very important for okay. your frame. Wherever you're at, just do a little bit more. Two, make subtle but important changes in your diet. Get rid of the red meat and fried food. Add in some more of the Mediterranean diet. You're still going to enjoy what you're eating. You can have a glass of wine, salmon, red wine, yogurt, fruit. It's not a tough thing. It's just changing the direction of what you're eating. Uh, the other things that I would do is I would consider I would consider getting some of these apps. Now, it's an interesting place to start. I don't know which ones I'm recommending, but there are brain training apps. Yeah. Brain training works. Certain governmental agencies are using it. We use brain training as brain rehab in our patients. Find some puzzles, find some content, read a book, do something unusual. Uh, that will also be good. And the fourth one I would say is, you know, try to find happiness. It's the most elusive thing. But we also know that people who have mental health issues or people who are depressed, their brains start to change. They are brain injured from the way they are thinking. So if it's within your power to be happier, to pursue relationships and crafts that make you happy, that will probably be the best thing for your brain. Rahul, great tips. I hope, well, I know that will have inspired people. You say to read more. Guys, I would recommend (laughs) that you get Rahul's new book, Life Lessons from a Brain Surgeon, The New Science and Stories of the Brain. It's It's a really fascinating read. 
Everything that Rahul and I spoke about will be on the show notes page for this episode of the podcast, drchastity.com forward slash brain surgeon. So do check them out. I'll try and get links to those studies that Rahul mentioned uh, in the conversation so you can check them out if you Thank are you. so inclined. Enjoy the rest of your stay in London and I hope we get to do this at some point in the future. Thank you for including me.